Happy Mother's Day again. Uh, it's good to celebrate moms on this weekend. Uh, today we're continuing a conversation where we're talking about the things that we've been rescued from by the resurrected Jesus Christ and we've been rescued to. That this new thing happened when Jesus walked out of the tomb and when he gave this incredible truth to anyone that will call on him as Lord saying, you also are a resurrected people. And what does that mean? And so today we're going to be talking about that we've been rescued from doubts to a life of daring, daring, courageous faith. So today we're kind of talking about the difference between faith and doubting. Now, before we start, I, I, think, I think it's important to start here that if we're all honest, I think all of us will go through seasons of doubt. Times where we have questions, times where something's going on, and it's like, what is going on here? I, I think some of my most intimate times with God is when I was yelling at him. How can you let this out? What is going on? I remember back in college, where I thought I was going to marry this girl, right? We, I think all of us had that person. We thought that was it. And I remember in prayer saying, God, take control of this relationship. He's like, finally. And then he took it. She broke up with me. I've never been broken up with before. Are you serious? Over. We were engaged. That was hard. I remember the drive out to try to win her back, yelling at God the whole way. I remember God's voice so clearly in the midst of my yelling was, I will be eclipsed by no one. Why did God take the relationship? Because I allowed it to define me and started eclipsing his glory in my life. He's not going to have it. He's jealous. He's not going to let that happen. Right? But in the moment, I thought God was just so terrible. Hindsight 2020, I look back on my life and I say, thank you, Lord. Right? Thank you, Lord, because I married way up. All right? Thank you, Lord. But we're going to be talking about that. I've had doubts, I've had questions, I've had hard times, I think all of us had. Is it okay to question? Yes. Is it okay to be mad at God? Yes. Is it okay to even go through some doubts? Yes. And at Glory Day, we want to be a place where you can bring that. Remember, you don't have to be perfect to follow Jesus, but you definitely have to be honest. And we don't have the questions to everything. There's definitely going to be questions where in love I have to say, I don't know. I'm not God. I don't know. If it's not in here, I don't know. But there are questions to some things, but I think more importantly than the questions is how we walk through them. There's a way of going through doubt, struggles, all the anger, all the things in a way where it pushes us further away from God, and there's a way of doing it that actually increases our trust and our faith in him. Right? So the two things we need to avoid is getting stuck in our questions, stuck in our confusion, stuck in our doubts, but we also don't want to be people that pretend like we don't have them. Or my life is so good. Jesus actually has a living parable in Matthew 21 speaking into faith, doubt, and a life of prayer, meaning what we are dependent on. The story goes that Jesus is on his way probably from somewhere in Bethlehem towards Jerusalem. On the way, he gets hungry. So he goes up to a fig tree and, uh, to get a bite to eat. And he comes up to a tree that had leaves all over it. But when he gets up to it, there's no fruit. Normally, the leaves and the fruit will be growing around the same time. So the leaves on a fig tree signify there's fruit here. But when Jesus approaches it, there is none. And Jesus in Matthew 21, it says, May no fruit ever again come from you. And the fig tree withered at once. This is usually the portion where people are like, Oh, not a fig tree. And you're like, He made it, all right? It'll be okay. He's just doing some house cleaning, right? It's a glorified weed at this point. If it's not producing fruit, it's not doing what it was designed to do. But the disciples in that moment see him curse a fig tree and it withers on the spot. And they're like, whoa, what just happened? What just happened? And Jesus is going to teach two important lessons. Okay, The two important lessons have to do with fruit, no fruit, 
and our faith and dependence in him. The first lesson Jesus teaches is don't be like the fig tree that pretends to be full of fruit, but when Jesus comes to that life, there's no, nothing growing. Don't be the person, Jesus is saying, that, that knows the right things to say, wears the right things, posts the right things, does all the right Christianese things, but that it's actually a show. It's like the leaves saying, hey, check it out. I got it all together. But when Jesus approaches it, there's no fruit. Jesus is saying, don't, don't be like that. He's calling out the hypocrites. He's calling out the hypocrites. Then Jesus curses out the fig tree. It withers and dies. And then he turns to his disciples because they're in shock and awe. I mean, they just witnessed this crazy thing happened and Jesus turns to them because right now they're doubting. How can this happen? Like what? Like, and Jesus reminds them, you will be able to do this and far greater. You can even turn to a mountain and say, be thrown into the sea and if you have faith, it can be done. Don't doubt, believe. And then he has this line at the end of this thing. He says, and whatever you ask in prayer you will receive if you have faith. Remember, prayer is just a dependence. It's knowing where the source of power comes from. Are the disciples powerful enough on their own to throw a mountain into the sea? No, but they work for the one who does. So Jesus is making them a promise. If you ask in faith to me, amazing things will happen. Believe it. Don't doubt it. I am capable. I am capable of unbelievable amounts of growth in your life. Valuable lessons. Because faith is daring to believe the promises, even when it goes against your logic, your rationale, or what you would do if you were God. I'm going to say it again. It's really important. Faith is believing the big, radical, unbelievable promises of God, even when it goes against your logic, your rationale, or what you would do if you were God. Every person you meet is a person of faith. We were made to be that way. What we choose to put our faith in will define us as a person. I remember listening to this professor talk about the origins of the universe, the Big Bang Theory, all of it, kind of the whole narrative. I remember a time in my life where I ran down that rabbit trail just to kind of scope it out, just to see. You know, everyone was talking about it. So it's like, I don't want to be the person that's like uneducated and just throw rocks. Like, I'd rather be like, is there anything going on? So, you know, kind of poke your head in. So I was walking down this, I was listening to this pressure. One of the things that just blew me away, though, was how much faith you need to believe this. Because there were so many things that as he talked about it, he talked about it as scientific fact. And I was like, scientific fact? I go, it doesn't really make that much sense, to be honest. Maybe it's because I had the Holy Spirit. I don't know. But it just didn't make sense to me personally. I'm like, man, I'm going to have to really, really grow in my faith of this if I'm going to believe it. There were so many things that just didn't make sense. Like, why would an atheist who believes in evolution want to save the polar bears? It doesn't make sense. Isn't it survival of the fittest? You won. Why would it be in your heart to look after creation. Oh, check it out. In Genesis 1, God put it there. He said, you look after creation. It's inside of you. See, I'm a fair argumentation kind of person. Like, if you're going to believe it, then you go all the way. All right? Don't believe a portion of it because it sounds cool, but not all the way. Like, people are like, I'm vegan, but I eat meat on the weekends. Doesn't work. It's not fair argumentation. You go all the way. Be like, I'm gluten-free, except I like bread, you know? If you're going to do it, go all the way. <laughs> I'm type A. Leave me alone. All right. 
But I just couldn't get over it. I was like, you mean all these little creatures crawled out of a pond billions of years ago? Are they still crawling out of ponds? Why well, haven't seen a picture of them? Why, if we're evolving and getting better, wouldn't it make sense that at some point somebody's going to have a baby that's not just another little boy or girl? Like, it just doesn't make sense. In fact, when I look out at creation, even if from an objective standpoint, and then I read Genesis, I'm kind of like, yeah, that's what I see. I don't know, it just makes sense. That's me personally. Now, I'm not going down so far, but here's what I wanted to say, is it will be presented to you as scientific fact, and it's not. It's faith. You're believing it. Because a lot of that goes against my rationale, my logic, and definitely not what I would do if I was God, but I believe it. People will present all kinds of things. Didn't you know? There's UFOs. Faith. Didn't you know? Faith. Could be in money or the government. Could be in your power, your logic, your your might, your wisdom could be, it doesn't matter what it is. We are people of faith. It's what you put your faith in that will define you as a person. That even the most sincere of us will have doubts from time to time. We'll have doubts from time to time. In James 1, he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you can go to God and he will give to you generously without reproach. But ask in faith, don't doubt, for the one who doubts is like the wave of a sea, driven and tossed by the wind. That person will not suppose they will receive from the Lord. Every time I read this, I go, man, I'm so guilty of that sometimes. Sometimes there's just things that are hard to wrap our mind around, like the incarnation of God or the Trinity or just questions we have. We're like, what do I do with this? Sometimes just the character of God kind of blows me away. I mean, just think on that. That God is all-present, all-powerful, all-loving at all times. Now, some of you might be sitting there in doubt saying, oh yeah, prove it. Uh, In the Word, in every single one of these Bible passages, it says, I'll read to you one, but they all kind of say the same thing. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I could go through every one of those character traits of God and say it's what it says in Scripture. That God is all-powerful, He is all-knowing, He is all-loving at all times. But here's the basis for the crisis of faith. And I'm telling you this in more of an apologetics way. Could be in your own life or somebody you know. But when you meet someone, and they've gone through a really hard thing, really chaotic thing, something that just has wounded them, it is very real that they will have to doubt some aspect of the character of God in order for God to make sense. When something horrible happens in life, you, it raises, this is, the, this is the crisis of faith. If God's all-powerful, why didn't he stop it? If God's everywhere at all times, was he there? And if God's all-loving, why did he let it happen? And you're going to have to disbelieve something. You're going to have to doubt something of the character of God for that thing to make sense with the reality of the character of God. There are a lot of people struggling with a reality of God because of something that's happened in their life and it's just not equating. And it's hard. It's hard because scripture is clear to us that God doesn't change. So in those moments, whose perspective is changing, God's or mine? That if Jesus Christ, as Hebrews 13, 8 says, is the same yesterday, today, and forever, but we will go through things where we feel like God changed or something changed, like, wait a minute, this is not... I, I don't understand God. This doesn't make sense to me, God. If I was God, I definitely wouldn't let this happen. And it's hard 
to have a daring kind of faith that believes in the promises of God when those things are going on. I think the story that I oftentimes come back to time and time again is the story of Jesus with Thomas. Thomas gets dubbed Doubting Thomas. When, by the way, every disciple was doubting, and we all do too, right? Doubting Thomas. The way that Jesus approaches this situation gives me so much comfort in my own life. Because I think all of us can attach to Thomas in this. Jesus Christ rose from the dead, but Thomas hasn't seen him yet. And Jesus appears to the other disciples. This is all from John 20. He appears to the other disciples, but Thomas isn't in the room. So the other disciples go and tell Thomas when he comes, and they're like, oh, we saw Jesus. Oh, he's risen from the dead. And Thomas is like, nah, no way. That doesn't make sense. There's no way I could, no. I am not putting my faith in something that, no, not a chance. Unless I put my finger in the holes of his wrists, in the holes of his side, I'm not believing. For eight days, Jesus leaves Thomas in his doubt. And then eight days later, he appears to the disciples, and this time Thomas is with them. And Jesus appears to them, and he goes right up to Thomas and says, Thomas, put your finger in the hole, man. Put your finger in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Now here, this is why this story always gives me goosebumps. Because it's the best display of all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-loving at the same time in Jesus Christ. All-powerful. He rose from the dead. Nothing get more powerful than that. All-knowing. When Thomas was having his doubts with the disciples, was Jesus physically in the room? He wouldn't have been having doubts if Jesus was in the room. So if Jesus is not in the room to physically, personally hear Thomas say, unless I put my finger in the holes of his wrist and in the holes of his side, I'm not going to believe. And yet, when Jesus shows up eight days later, what's the first thing he does? Thomas. How did he know? Because he's all-knowing. Would you believe that in this very moment, Jesus already knows all your doubts, all your questions, all your hurts, all your hang-ups? He knows them all. The question is, are you going to talk to him about it? See, there's two different kinds of people in this world. There's the people that walk through and deal with the things that have happened in life, and there's the people that bury it and ignore it, thinking time will heal, which it doesn't, and it will affect them. See, the question for us as Christians is, again, that we're, we're, we're going to go through doubts. And, and by the way, I'm telling you, your pastor's gone through doubts. I've had questions. I've been mad at God. So maybe we just need to demystify that word doubt because I still think there's a lot of us that feel we're somehow a lesser Christian because I had a doubt. No. It's how you deal with the doubt, how you deal with the questions, how you deal with the anger. If you get stuck in it, Yes, it's going to deeply affect you and your relationship with the people around you and your relationship with God. But if we move into it, we talk about it, we deal with it, and we bring those questions, we bring those doubts to the resurrected Jesus Christ, our doubts, our questions, our hang-ups can actually grow our faith. My faith is stronger today because of the crud I went through. Not in spite of it. 
It's moving through those things, talking about it, working through it, that we increase, we sanctify in a greater way. Would Thomas have grown in his faith if Jesus didn't appear to him? But Jesus knew what Thomas needed because he's all knowing and he's all loving. So loving. And I'll tell you why. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. He's got a perfect body, risen from the dead, perfect body. Why are there holes in his wrists? Why is there even holes for Thomas to put his finger into? Why did Jesus let those ride? If you bring your car to a place to get fixed up, you're going to be like, hey, leave that dent in the back. It reminds me of a tough accident. No, you're going to be like, get it out of there, right? Why does Jesus leave the holes? He left the holes so that forever we would be reminded of how deep his love is for you. So that no matter what's going on in your life, you can look at those holes in his wrist and in his side. And remember, that's how deep his love is for you. Because things in life will happen that will make you question his love. I heard a quote from Tim Keller one time that said, if Jesus is who he says he is, and he did as scripture says he did, then at no time can we as followers say that he doesn't care, that God doesn't care. No, he cared so deeply deeply that he would even send his own son. Jesus cared so deeply that he would even willingly become your sin, become the curse, taking a place on a cross, putting holes in himself, hanging on a cross for you. That's how deeply he cares about you. So that you could be made whole in him. But his goal, his goal was not just for a perfect life on this side of the kingdom. His goal is to unite you with himself. So that all he is will be all you are in totality one day in the kingdom of God. I can't control the future. I could get a... I could go to the doctor tomorrow and be like, dude, you got stage four cancer. How easy would it be in that moment to be like, how dare you, God? And Jesus would show me the holes in his wrist and say, you'll be healed. Because you're a part of me. My daughter could ride her bike down the sidewalk today, fall off her bike, smash her head. It could happen I'm not in control. It'd be so easy, and I probably would for a while, turn to God and be like, how dare you? And in that moment, God could show me the holes in his wrist, the holes in his side, and said, your daughter's covered in my love. She's fine. There's so many things that could happen in life. And what happens is these things happen in our world. And it does. It's like if God's all powerful, if God's all knowing, if God's all loving, then how, why? I don't get it. And Jesus says, I am all knowing, I am all powerful, I am all loving. And I proved what I did with that when I went to the cross for you so that I could bring you to my kingdom. And I want to bring you home. Hang in there. In this world, you will have so much suffering and a lot of tribulation, but take heart. I overcome the world. Have faith in me. I've made you big, bold promises, big, daring promises. Faith is believing those promises even when our eyes don't understand. You know, I wrote down a quote. Um, It's from a song that was written by um, a singer-songwriter named Michael Card. And it says, that's what faith must be. And this is the chorus of this song. He said, to hear with my heart, to see with my soul, to be guided by a hand I cannot hold, to trust in a way that I cannot see, that's what faith must be. Can't trust your eyes. Can't always trust my feelings. You trust the promises. 
You trust the promises of Jesus saying, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. All those who call me Lord will be saved. That when you're weak and heavy laden, I will give you rest. If you abide in me, I will abide in you and you will bear much fruit. Trust in me. Have faith in me. That's what it means to follow Jesus. It's, it's the only way to combat the doubts. So here's, to me, this is the most simplified three-step process that personally I do in my life, but you might have a different recipe, and that's totally fine, whatever works. When you go through a season of doubt, when you go through a question, you go through things, for me personally, it's talk to God about it. Honestly. You want to be angry with him? He can handle it. You want to question him? Question him. You want to go after it? Go after it. Just go after him. God doesn't change. So whatever it is that's riled you up, at some point, you're going to come into that space of God doesn't change. I changed. How did I change? And it will grow your faith. Or, and, or, and, do both. Talk to someone you trust. Maybe you want to flip-flop one and two. Maybe talk to someone you trust and then go talk to God about it. Or maybe there's someone in your life who's going through something really hard and they come tell you about it because they trust you. One of the most loving things you can do for them is say, hey, can we pray about this? Can we talk to God together about this? Would you be okay with that? And don't just insert your own voice. Maybe encourage them because I'll be honest, when you're going through a really hard time, talking to God is the hardest thing. It is painful, it is difficult. And sometimes we need someone to hold our hand and help us get to that point where we can be angry at the right person. But what happens when you start praying that kind of prayer, requesting those kind of requests, laying those things out, is it regains a kingdom perspective. You know, sometimes when you're going through a season of doubt, season of questioning, sometimes it's worth sort of looking back on your life and seeing all the things that God has done already, all the handprints of God through the many things you've been through. Maybe it's in the present moment looking around at who God has surrounded you with. And then sometimes we need to look forward and we need to be reminded That the goal of Jesus Christ is to get you home. If Jesus is who he says he is, then we know he cares about us. One more line from that song I want to share with you from Michael Card's song. He said this, Now I understand that there is a key. This is a key of faith. It's Jesus in me, a reality. That God is in Christ and that Christ in me, that with faith, I see what is unseen. Faith is a miracle that's given to us by the power of the Holy Spirit where we can see, unsee things, believe incredible things, and have faith in things that go way beyond our logic, our experience, or even what we would do if we were God. Faith is amazing, and Jesus promises that if you need more, talk to him about it. He'll give it to you. You're struggling? Talk to him about it. He'll help you. You're mad? Go talk to him about it. You're happy? Go talk to him about it. Bold, believing, daring prayers are honored by the Lord. And just never forget, no matter what you go through in your life, I want you to be reminded that at any time you can go back to the holes in his wrists and remember they were put there for you. They're not changing. They're forever, and so are you. So go in peace this day. May you be encouraged by this message, and remember to talk about it with whatever you're going through, and that's how we grow. Amen? Amen.